Hi, this is Tom Alexander in Miami. And I'm Walter Kolowski from Boston. And this is the Jazz Rocks Podcast. And welcome, everyone, to the Jazz Rocks Podcast, along with Walter Koloski. My name is Tom Alexander. It is podcast number four and also podcast number one of 2017. We were off for a little while, but we are back, and it's great to be back. Walter, how are you? I'm doing great. I missed doing the show, but we were busy. We were busy. Had a lot going on over the holidays, just obviously just the typical holiday stuff going on, but then a lot of projects and just keeping us both busy. And we didn't get a chance to record a, a show for January, but here we are in February and uh, we're, we're, it's great to be back. That's for sure. I'm happy to be back. And uh, I proclaim 2017 the year of the Jazz Rocks podcast. All right. I like the sound of that. And uh, speaking of sounds, you heard some great sounds when you took a little uh, trek down to New York to see uh, some real true legends of the music and uh, celebrating uh, the ongoing birthday of the one and only Chick Corea. Why don't you tell us, tell our listeners a little bit about that? Well, that birthday went on for three months at the Blue Note, mm-hmm. three whole months, and he played with various uh, aggregations of great musicians. The shows I went to go see, no surprise to some people, would be the uh, quartet with John McLaughlin, Victor Wooten, and Lenny White. And uh, Chick's wife uh, made a guest appearance on a couple of vocal numbers, which was great. Amazing music. I've seen John 50 or 60 times. I've seen Chick many times. I've seen Victor and Lenny many times. I was thrilled uh, yeah. by yeah. what by what I heard this, this night uh, for both shows. They were playing outside all night, especially John. Yeah. Uh, Chick was very generous host. Not that he didn't play, right. but he left a lot of space for these other players. John in particular, and I think that was on purpose. It was a mutual admiration society that night, let me tell you. I'm sure. With playing three three months straight, I'm sure Chick could uh, sort of pick and choose his spots, <laughs> you know, to, to let his friends uh, sort of uh, really take the lead in, in uh, some choice moments there. And it sure sounded like uh, you had a great time. I haven't heard John play that outside in many years. Really? And this was even on the standard material, Tom. He mm-hmm. was he was out there. When you say out there, you're so, you're really stretching the harmonic and rhythmic limits, would you say, of of, uh, of the music happening around him? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and as I said, it was even in the, on the standards. They played a Miles Davis piece. They really stretched the music, but in an enjoyable way, not just to stretch it out. Yeah. But to have fun. I yeah. once uh, I once described playing outside to a friend of mine who asked... I asked him to visualize a house where all the windows and doors were boarded up, and the musician was running around the house desperately trying to get inside the house. I think that pretty much uh, covers it. You know, it explains it pretty well. Those musicians who can really play outside without losing you are 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 the greatest. You know, they're the ones that you know when you are really going outside and and you you've got the listener along for the ride. That is fun to behold. The only negative aspect about this event was having to deal with the Blue Note. So I have to be very honest here. It is not one of my favorite venues. Right. First of all, you're packed in there like you're inside a bag of marbles. (laughs) It's that tight. You yawn and you knock over somebody's wine two tables away. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's a little tight. No, that, I've been, that, I've seen a couple shows there, and yes, it is, it is a little bit, a little, a little bit thick with people. No question about it. That's only part of the problem. The other, right. pro- the other problem, especially in winter, is mm-hmm. having to wait outside in line. It's, yeah. tw- it's twenty bone chilling degrees out there. Right, you're lined up with hundreds of people transporting viruses from every state in the union right the right. last three it's, it's, the, a, it's a literal fusion of of germs is that what you're saying absolutely the last right. three times tom uh-huh. the last three times i've gone to the blue note have been in the winter and i've had to stay outside there and wait mm-hmm. all three times within a day or two of arriving home i had the flu the price we pay to go listen to some fusion music 
but it was worth it, wasn't it? At the end, it was worth it. it, it you got you got sick, you didn't feel well, you were freezing, but you got to hear Chick and John, right? So, I mean, that was pretty much, that pretty much did it for you. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. All right. Well, that's it. We did get some, some unfortunately, some some very sad news uh, from, from our world of jazz and fusion. We were hoping that they would have long lives, but unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. Victor Bailey and Alphonse Muzon. Yeah, Victor Bailey, a great bassist, uh, best known for weather report and solo material. Yeah, uh, a teacher at Berkeley for many years here in Boston. Mm -hmm. Ironically or sadly, last year I gave a talk to students at Berkeley, and I was filling in for Victor, who couldn't make it because he was ill. Right. Uh, Alphonse Muzon, also known for weather report and solo projects, mind transplant comes to mind. Right. If I could be redundant. But I eleventh house in the eleventh. Yeah, eleventh house. house is what we know him for, right? Mostly, I think, or at least what I, the band I associate with him. Yeah. He also, uh, you know, another s sad connection. The uh, book I'm working on, which we've discussed in past shows, uh, over the past year, he contributed some commentary for it. So I've connected in some way to both of these uh, great artists in real life, but of course. Uh, music is where they left their mark and where they'll be missed. But the thing about music is it's always around and we can listen to it anytime we want. That's true. That's true. So our our condolences to the respective families of uh, Victor Bailey and uh, Alphonse Muzan. So lots of other things going on. Uh, we got a, we have a new feature coming up, which we're going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. And uh, uh, j just a lot of, a lot of fun stuff uh, that that's sort of transpired and new things we're going to try out on the show since we last joined our listeners. Yeah, and I think your CD came out after our last show. How's that going? It's going great. Um, actually, uh, it's it's uh, a digital release only this time. Oh, Walter, uh, okay. No, no, no discs were actually no physical discs were actually pressed, but uh, you can get the album on uh, iTunes and other major uh, distributors, Amazon, and so forth. The album is called Overbrook Avenue. And it's a tribute to the the street I grew up grew up on in in Pennsylvania. It's an acoustic album. It's a primarily acoustic piano with acoustic guitar and a little bit of electric uh, support. You know, some some uh, keyboards and a, a little bit of electric guitar as well. Uh, played by my good friend Mr. John Fifield, great guitar player and a, a dear friend. And he co-produced the album. And uh, it's really I think uh, best described as a. Um, Sort of in the in the spirit of a, a, a As Falls Wichita Falls album, you know, Matheny Mays kind of a vibe. So it's not rip and burn fusion, but it certainly falls into that category of music we grew up on, uh, and 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 that acoustic, the acoustic side of fusion, if you will, and sort of melodic and harmonic and uh, mostly original compositions, uh, a couple of uh, familiar themes as well. But um, uh, I'm excited about it. The feedback has been tremendous. And uh, you can again, you can go to uh, iTunes or wherever you buy digital music. And the album again is called Overbrook Avenue. It's under my name, Tom Alexander. Thanks for the uh, the shameless plug. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Oh, just uh, one last thing: if you do get the uh, version on iTunes. It also comes with a digital booklet uh, that's included, so it gives you liner notes and photos and background information on the recording itself. So that's that's on iTunes only, but uh, it's, uh, again, feedback's been great, so I'm excited about it and to let our listeners know about it. I know there was some information you wanted to share about a good friend of the show and a person who is a, a real major, major figure in fusion. We're talking about the head of Moon June Records. Uh, yeah. Everyone knows him as Leo. Full name is Leo Pavkovich. And he's been running that organization uh, for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. He's a godsend to progressive jazz rock fusion musicians all over the world, though I believe he doesn't like labels. I do. We just want to throw our support behind him. He's been in the news a little bit lately. I just want to reiterate what a great representative and promoter of the type of music you and I love and our listeners love all over the world. He helps artists who otherwise would not get the recognition, not that they wouldn't get any, uh, but he certainly gets them more. He works tirelessly yes. on behalf of musicians, again, from all over the world. If any of our listeners want to support this music and more than just listening to us, 
I highly suggest you check out the Moon June catalog. You will not be disappointed. There is great fusion in jazz rock, progressive music, whatever we want to call it. It's being produced, and uh, Leo is one of the guys behind its production. I, uh, I see Leo as a brother in the cause. Absolutely. And that's uh, Leo from Moon June Records. Uh, we mentioned, uh, we just sort of alluded to a new segment that we're going to do beginning with this very show here. It's called the JRP Featured Artist. And what it really allows uh, our listeners to hear is our, our their favorite artists uh, to sort of uh, tell us a little bit about themselves and their music. And the debut is from a guitarist uh, based in uh, California, and his name is Rob Garland. Not only is his music terrific, but he just did a bang-up job on this first edition of the JRP Featured Artist. I'm very excited about it. First of all, wonderful music. I love the music. Yeah. Wonderful presentation. In fact, the perfect template for any of you out there interested in following in Rob's footsteps. That's going to be our last segment today. Right. And don't go anywhere. <laughs> Make sure you listen to it because it's going to be worth your while. Uh, Rob is a, a jazz rock blues guitarist. That's what I'd call him. I know he does some vocals, but I don't think we're going to hear any of that today. It's just a fantastic listen and uh, very excited about this new feature. And uh, coming up next is an interview with one of the true major figures of the golden age of fusion, and that would be the first, the first age of fusion. I think the golden age continues beyond that, but let's face it, the, the 70s were the, those glory years that we all remember, and I'm going to let you tell our listeners who that is. Our interview subject for podcast number four is pianist, composer... Stu Goldberg. He's been around for a while. Wayne Shorter, Billy Cobb, Jack Bruce, John McLaughlin, Ma Vishnu. Over the years, uh, after the fusion heyday, he's had a tremendous career in soundtracks, video games. In fact, uh, the music that we'll hear playing in and out the interview today mm -hmm. is a uh, titled Super Zombie Boss. Yes. We will be the first to hear it. The public hasn't heard it yet. We'll be the first to hear it. He's a wonderful interview, very interesting stories. As we said, he was around uh, when things really blew apart. And I mean that in a positive way. They blew yeah. apart when Fusion right. was really popular. Really looking forward to our fans listening to our interview with Stu. We're going to move into segment two in just a moment, but before we do... I'd like to uh, share some new music now with a, an East Coast bass saxophone player by the name of Mike Casey. His brand new recording, The Sound of Surprise, live at the side door, is currently available across the digital music spectrum, as we say. And this is the lead single. He, he refers literally refers to it as the single uh, from his brand new album. This is called Hydraulics. Back in a moment. <laughs> I'm Jimmy Herring. You're listening to the Jazz Rocks Podcast with Tom Alexander and Walter Koloski. Do you like jazz rock and fusion with the power and passion of the 70s mixed with the techno fizz of contemporary music? Foxy Productions in the UK at www.andersonshelter.co.uk features the punk jazz of the fabulous Bird Architects, Diamond Dust, playing the music of Tony Williams' Lifetime and John McLaughlin, the electrofusion of Jazz Nat's Electronique, and the mystical sonics of metaphysical soundscapes. Our catalogue has over 20 diverse artists, so if Electric Miles, Soft Machine, Mahavishnu or Weather Report is your bag, Visit us at www.andersonshelter.co.uk. That's shelter with a T-A. Foxy Productions. 
Sounds from a different musical planet. Artist and composer Stu Goldberg was in the jazz rock fusion vanguard. Most of us first heard of him playing with uh, John McLaughlin, and in fact, he and Jonas Helborg may be the only players who were in three distinct McLaughlin bands. But the story didn't end after McLaughlin. Stu would go on to play more engaging fusion, study and perform Eastern classical music, and he continues to make his mark in the soundtrack worlds of both television and the movies, winning numerous awards. Uh, my understanding is you even compose uh, music for video games, Stu. The Jazz Rocks Podcast welcomes the great Stu Goldberg. Hi, Stu. Hey, Walter. How are you, pal? I'm doing great. Nice talking to you. We've been in touch over the years. I always enjoy speaking with you. We're, we're going to mostly talk about your participation in the Jazz Rock movement today, Stu. Uh, but we should do a little biographical precursor, I think. Uh, when did you develop an interest in music? What was your education, and why did you end up focusing on jazz, if you did? Uh, well, I guess my, my parents said I was always interested in music, but uh, as a kid, I didn't know that. I started the trombone uh, at the age of nine, and at the age of ten, I started uh, piano lessons. And, at the age, and I wasn't much interested in the lessons. I was more interested in playing in bands, because I thought that's where I could meet the girls. So, <laughs> When I was 11, I started playing professionally. Uh, it, it, I grew up in Seattle. I guess I should back up. I, I'm actually from your neck of the woods. Uh, I was born in Malden. Wow. And uh, grew up in Seattle. Malden, by the and, way, folks, is just outside Boston. Boston, yeah, suburb of Boston. Right. So uh, I was born in Malden. At six months old, uh, we moved to Seattle. And, uh, yeah, like I said, at the age of uh, 11, I was playing in rock bands, playing organ uh, with one hand and tambourine with the other. <laughs> <laughs> and you, our, first jo our first job, the whole band made seven dollars, I think. And that's good money, even today, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was great. And when I was a teenager, I was playing organ. Uh, I was playing mainly organ in those days. Uh, piano was you know was destined to be my instrument, but it wasn't very portable. So um, I used to play in all the all the clubs where you had to be 21 to get in, and I used to wear this big hat and have a scarf on and <laughs> kind of go incognito as this young pre-teenager playing in these clubs. And uh, yeah, that was. And I used to uh, sneak out of the house at night and go here. Uh, Coltrane played in Seattle. In fact, he recorded a, a double album in Seattle at one point at this uh, at this club. And I was uh, I'm not on the album, but I'm outside listening through the door. <laughs> so, were you were you already playing uh, jazz at the young age when you were doing this? I was interested in jazz. I, I came to jazz via blues. Right. So in the, in the early days, I was more into blues. I, it was more understandable to me, but I, uh, my dad was a big jazz fan, and so I was exposed to Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Oscar Peterson, uh, you know, a lot of the classics, even as a child, because he would play them on the record player. So I had it kind of subliminally uh, floating around in my head. And then uh, as I got into blues, and it, uh, I was really into Jimmy Smith on the organ. Yeah. And he drew me closer into jazz. Okay, so at some point you became, quote unquote, a professional musician. Were you playing jazz at that time? Well, I was playing pop, uh, you know, when I was 11 and 12 and 13, playing, you know, the, the hits that we heard on the radio and and. Uh, trying to figure them out and play them live and playing dances, high school dances, that kind of thing. Uh, later, I got way more into serious music uh, playing jazz, e even as a teenager. Like I'd say 14, 15, I was deep into it. And uh, you were uh, hitting the road at all? Not in those days. That was my dream. Uh, all I could think of, my, my only focus was to be a touring jazz musician. 
And of course, my parents wanted me to get an education. So I was, uh, I, I, I hit the books pretty hard, wanted to get my school career done with so that I could officially go out on the road, because that's what I really wanted to do. So I, I skipped a year of high school, and I actually skipped uh, a year and a half of college as well. And uh, I graduated at 19, and uh, then I moved to L.A., and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that part of the story. And uh, by, shortly after, I met John McLaughlin. How did he, how did he find out about you, Stu? Uh, my college jazz band uh, varied in size from about eight people to 12. And uh, chief among the members were the Fowler brothers, Bruce, Tom, Ed, Walt, and, and um, Steve, who died tragically a few years ago. And they were all amazing jazz musicians. And uh, th three of them played with Frank Zappa. Yeah, Frank's we, we associate them with uh, Frank Zappa, absolutely. That's right. So... Um, when, uh, when Zappa came to town to Salt Lake one time, uh, uh, Bruce was in the band, and he told me that they were coming. So I set up a concert at the school, uh, at the university that I was attending, uh, Uni University of Utah, with my local band that we had there. And Bruce came and brought uh, some of the members of Zappa's band, including George Duke. And uh, George Duke and I hit it off really well. He was such a great guy. He, he died tragically a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, and he told me, you know, he really dug what I was into. And he said, if you ever come to L.A., look me up. So two years later, I did uh, move to Los Angeles. I called him up and he was super friendly. And uh, he's the one who recommended me to Zap, uh, to uh, John McLaughlin. And John gave you a call. John gave me a call uh, in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't there. I was I was working a, a six-night-a-week job uh, at a hotel in Anaheim, California. I was living in Santa, Santa Monica, California, and it was, I don't know, an hour-and-a-half drive, six nights a week playing uh, uh, standards and piano bar and, you know, really lame, uh, <laughs> a really lame gig in a hotel. And... Uh, doing rehearsal bands every day during the day and going all over town and trying to see what kind of trouble I could get into musically. And I came home at three in the morning one night and there was a, a phone message on my uh, on my machine from John McLaughlin, whom I had never met. But you knew his music. Well, of course. I, mean, I was a huge fan of the of the uh, Inner Mounting Flame. Uh, and I think Birds of Fire had just come out. Well, yeah, no, it had come out also. And you were, uh, you were being called ostensibly to replace Gail Moran, is that right? Right, right. he didn't put it that way. Right. Uh, he said in the message that uh, he's in town looking for a keyboard player, and George Duke said that he should check me out. So here I am at 3, 3 a.m., <laughs> and of course I didn't sleep the whole rest of the night. I'm all, I'm all wondering what the proper etiquette is. When, when can I call a musician back? Right. And I waited till 7 a.m., which was a ridiculously early time. But I called him at 7. And in those days, he was into uh, street chimnoy and meditation. Yeah. So 7 a.m. for him was the middle of the day. Yeah, he was probably up for three or four hours yeah, already. He was probably up when I was up. <laughs> right. Exactly. I didn't know that. So I called him, and he, he came over in his rental car to my tiny little uh, duplex in Santa Monica. And that was that's how I met him. If I remember uh, correctly from our past conversations, it was one of the most unusual auditions you ever had. It, it really was. I barely played for him. I had, you know, I had a Moog synthesizer. I, I had a, a clavinet. I had uh, my, my piano there. I didn't hardly play for him. I played him a couple cuts from an album that I had done with my, my band from college um, that Oliver Nelson produced. A uh, really nice album. I play, played him one or two cuts from that, and then he seemed uh, a little bit distracted, and he was more interested in, in what books I was reading than my music. <laughs> and he was kind of looking at my library, and he noticed uh, on the table I had a book by uh, Param Hansa Yogananda, the uh, autobiography of a yogi. Yes. He seemed to be impressed with that, uh, and maybe that sealed the deal. I, I don't know, but... Uh, a couple of days later, I got a call from his manager in New York and said, uh, John wants you to come to New York. Yeah, it was like he was looking at you as a person. Uh, no, as a, as, I mean, he had always had a sixth sense about someone's musicianship that didn't, he didn't necessarily evaluate it through what normal people would, would evaluate. He had kind of a sixth sense. 
And I guess he picked something up that he liked uh, about me, and, and that was it. And then I was in the band. Now, I know it wasn't a direct uh, following of Jan Hammer, but let's face facts. Jan Hammer was a legend even then. Um, I know the answer to this question, but I want our listeners to know, did you ever feel pressure to live up to that, uh, that history of Jan Hammer? Uh, and what was your relationship with uh, Jan Hammer like at that time? Uh, well, I had not met Jan. I was familiar with his work uh, prior to McLaughlin. He had he had been a I mean a, a tremendous keyboard player with with Sarah Vaughan, and he did a really cool album with Jeremy Steig, uh, kind of rare. And I loved his playing on it, and uh, I was a big fan. And then of course what what he did in in uh, in Mahavishnu was so astounding and original. And, uh, uh, you know, what he was able to do with the Moog synthesizer was absolutely uh, pioneering. I mean, no one had ever done that, ever. So, yeah, the, the trailblazing work he did with McLaughlin was uh, absolutely astounding. And I didn't feel a direct pressure to answer your question. I mean, nobody was saying you got to play it like Jan would play it. But, of course, at, at my young age of 19 and 20, I, I, he was a tremendous influence. And I remember spending... Uh, every waking minute <laughs> trying to uh, develop my bending technique on the mini moog you know the uh, the, the mini moog uh, uh, allows you to bend notes pitch bend which you can't do on a piano and so you can uh, approximate uh, guitars and flutes and other other instruments where you can actually you know uh, uh, portamento between notes so uh, i would spend hours and hours and hours bending and and trying to, to you know, hold down one note and play as many melodies as I, as I can with the bend wheel. Had you been playing the Moog before then? Yes, but not in that way. Not in that way. Now, <laughs> eventually, if I remember, you, 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 you'd you meet Jan. Uh, I met jo uh, Jan through John at some social occasion or a party or a concert or backstage or something. And, and he was super friendly and, and uh, inviting. And he, uh, you know, I remember on a couple of occasions, he invited me up to his studio up upstate New York. And we hung out and we played and he played drum and he was an amazing drummer. I mean, God, he, he could do everything on the drums that anybody could do. And uh, of course, it's a killer on the keyboards. And we, we, had, we hit it off. Uh, we had a great time together. Walter's interview jazz and fusion keyboardist Stu Goldberg will continue in just a moment. Manifold Recording, located just outside of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, expands the concept of studio recording to encompass the energy and audience of a live performance. Learn how Grammy-nominated engineer Ian Schreier uses full-scale rooms with 24-foot ceilings to capture real acoustic magic. mixes on a 64-channel API Vision console to produce the truest representation of the music. Jazz rock stars Jimmy Herring, Wayne Krantz, Gary Husband, and Joey Colorazzo have performed and recorded at Manifold Recording. You can too. For more information, visit manifoldrecording.com or on Facebook at facebook.com slash manifoldrecording. That's M-A-N-I-F-O-L-D recording.com. Hi, I'm John McLaughlin. You are listening to the Jazz Rocks Podcast with Tom Alexander and Walter Kolowski. Music, fusion, jazz, rock, Funk, smooth, funky. Keep listening. What was the most challenging part about playing the fusion of the Mahavishnu Orchestra in those days? For me, when I first started the band, the, the most challenging part was getting the cues, because... John was, uh, how can I say, he didn't conduct like like you would expect a conductor to conduct. And he, he, it was almost telepathic. You had to kind of just be on the same wavelength to know when 
different sections would come and when different things would move to to other parts of the music. So that for uh, particularly when we uh, started working as a quartet after the when I first joined the band there were 11 of us and it was more structured. It was uh, you know there were structured arrangements and there was a, a string quartet and a couple of horns plus the the core band members. So uh, the music was structured. Uh, then later we uh, went on the road as a quartet, and it was uh, John and I were the only melody players, so we would be exchanging back and forth, and the music would be morphing rather freely from one section to another. And uh, at the beginning, it was challenging to pick up the cues. Uh, uh, eventually, I got it, but it was uh, like I say, because he wouldn't just nod his head and look at you and say, "Now we're going to do this and that." It, it was more telepathic. Well, it must have worked because you were in three different bands. That's pretty rare for a McLaughlin uh, band member. And also, you know, you talk about playing the melody parts when he was playing that synthesizer. And I know we've spoken a couple of times on the phone when I've had a question about some tune off that album. And I'd ask you, is that you or McLaughlin? And we can't tell. Uh, well, we were pl actually playing the same instrument. Right. <laughs> he, he had six mini mogs. I had one. Um I mean, I can tell, to be honest with you, but uh, it was a very exciting time. And the, you know, the, the innovation that was happening uh, technologically with all the instruments and keyboards and that even accelerated in the 80s. But even back then in the middle 70s, it was, it was so cool what was coming out and what the possibilities of uh, music you could create with these new instruments. Uh, after that quartet, which is a great regret for me in my life that I never saw that band live, just didn't have the opportunity. But after that Mahavishnu Quartet, uh, you were in One Truth Band, which was very different than Mahavishnu to me. It was much more rhythmic uh, mm -hmm. than Mahavishnu had been. But then you were part of this fascinating band that everyone had hoped would be the next fusion supergroup, and that was the band with McLaughlin, Billy Cobham, and Jack Bruce, and you formed a quartet, and you uh, toured through Europe. There are some low-quality tapes, let me put it that way, floating around that indicate that music, if that music had continued, it was going to be sort of this amalgam of uh, McLaughlin and Jack Bruce compositions. I don't know, Did were you writing for that band? Did they play a tune of yours? Uh, yes, we did a couple tunes of mine, and uh, that was a great opportunity, obviously, for me, because uh, I was the youngest member of that group by far, and yet uh, they gave us all equal billing. Yeah, they tour. did. Yeah, they did. Uh, and, yeah, I got to write tunes. Everybody was writing tunes. We did tunes of Billy's, tunes of John's, tunes of Jack's, and it was so exciting. It was such a shame that band didn't continue, and and for, for such wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah, tell me about the demise. Well, the, the manager was a cokehead, and he embezzled all the money of the tour and refused to pay people. And he was a, a master manipulator. And he would tell one band member that uh, the other band member said not to pay them. So the, the, the enmity grew between the, the, the players before we realized that we were, were all being uh, played by this guy. So uh, I ended up never getting paid for that tour. Uh, Billy got all his. I think everyone else got paid eventually. I, I never got a dime for that tour. But yeah, I, I, I heard Billy uh, visited the guy personally, <laughs> and he got paid. That's what I heard later on. Uh, My understanding was he had all the money in advance in escrow, which is super smart. Billy is super smart. Right. I think he had it arranged that the money had been uh, guaranteed prior to him leaving his house. Now, I know, I hope some of that enmity, as you mentioned, passed, because eventually uh, John played with Billy again live at Montreux, and uh, a couple of years later, he played with Jack again. Uh, yeah, no, I've Montreux. seen all of them since the tour. Um, uh, Jack, you know, sadly passed a few years ago, but I've seen Billy and John, and I, I had seen Jack after the tour. There was no personal enmity. It was just uh, at the time, in the heat of the moment, it was... Right. Uh, I mean, there was there was talk of going to Japan and going to to the states and, and South America with that band and and making albums and all and none of that ever happened because the, the, everything just fizzled. Yeah, that's a loss for sure. Uh, after you know, after that though, you put out your uh, solo album. That was Eye of the Beholder. Was that the first one? Uh, well, the first one was called Solos Duos Trio, and that was with Larry Coryell and El Subramanium. 
Okay, that's right. Because I was going to. Uh, uh, that was my first solo album. Yeah, I was going to uh, mention El Subramanian, uh, El Subramanian yeah. too. And um, when did you develop an interest in uh, that Eastern music? Was that uh, stemming from Mahavishnu, or had you been interested before that? Uh, well, I, I always had an interest in music from all over the world, but through through uh, my experience in Mahavishnu, I met El Shankar, who now calls himself Shankar. Right, uh, and he became a very close friend. Uh, we, we, uh, you know, I heard him in Shakti and met him back in those days it, uh, when the original Mahavishnu band broke up. Uh, it was so that John could pursue Shakti, and I became friends with all of those guys in those days, um, and and remained friends. And then later, Sh Shankar joined uh, the One Truth Band as a, a you know a very major member. And we were hanging out like crazy every day, and and, and I kind of kind of through osmosis I picked up the the f fanaticism for Indian music, and Shankar introduced me to his older brother uh, El Subramanium. So, so you so you're familiar with the conical? Oh yeah. yeah and you study and you studied the Indian percussion. I did. I, I studied uh, uh, tabla, classical tabla for three years with a student of uh, Pandit Swapan Chaudhuri in Los Angeles. And you put out an album. Uh, well, I put out an album where I, I had my percussion debut, yeah, Dark Clouds. Uh, but uh, the percussion, that, the great percussion on that album is by Cassius Khan, a tabla player who is just an astounding musician. That's still available, that album, correct? We can get uh, that. Yeah. On my website. So that's StuGoldberg.com, and you can check out Dark Clouds, which I highly recommend. Thank you. Um, after that, uh, well, and during this, at some point, you became involved in uh, recording on soundtracks. I mean, your music, your playing, appears on movies like Inner Space, Indiana Jones, and The Last Crusade. There are some others, of course. You eventually started writing soundtracks, which has been your main focus for many years years now, I believe, and most people listening will be familiar with uh, the TV show The Amazing Race and others. You provided music uh, for that for many years and whatnot. How did you get into this aspect of your career, which seems very successful? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was touring all over the world for 10, 12 years, and I saw the signs that the, the, the music life was not always going to be as fruitful as it had been as far as touring and support of record companies. Everything was going downhill. Uh, and I got married. We had three kids. And we were living in Germany at the time. And I said, this, uh, this may not last forever. So I, I was trying to reflect and say, what, what can I do in music and, and still be around uh, you know, to be a father to my kids? And I said, oh, I'll be a film composer because I studied composition in college. I'd always been a writer and I thought that would be a, a natural fit for me. And of course, I didn't realize the, the politics of it. it. It was incredibly difficult, but we moved everybody. We had three kids. We moved from Germany to, uh, to Los Angeles where I knew no one and was, uh, I thrust myself into the, uh, the soundtrack and, and film and TV scene there. And it was eight years before I got to write any music of my own. I, I became a, a keyboard player in the, in the studio orchestras. So that's what I did for eight years. And then I started uh, ghostwriting for other composers. And I started my first recording studio. And I would have composers come to my studio to help them finish their scores. Uh, and through that, I got referrals to, uh, to jobs of my own. And then I started writing for TV shows and movies. And you work at home, and uh, you're, you have studios up in British Columbia, right? That's correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm based up in B.C. right now. You've won quite a few awards, uh, Stu, and recently uh, what's known as the Leo Award from the government of British Columbia. Yeah, that's a B.C. award. Uh, I got that for a documentary that I did, uh, a fascinating documentary about a, a woman dying of cancer and going to India to try to get Ayurvedic uh, treatment and her ex final acceptance of, uh, of her death. It, it was a fascinating documentary, and I did a kind of a, a conglomerate score that had some Indian influence uh, as well as Western. What's the name of the documentary for those interested? Uh, Chi, C-H-I. C-H-I. Yeah. You, have you been able to find any way to sneak a little fusion music into your soundtracks? Uh, 
Yes, I do all the time. I mean, I'm me. <laughs> so I, I sneak everything of me into uh, everything I do. So, I mean, this one of my latest projects uh, was writing for a video game called Death Rising 4. <laughs> uh, and, and there's actually a couple tracks. Or there's three tracks from my score to that, to that game on, uh, on my website. And a lot of what I wrote for orchestra is very fusion. I mean, it could totally be played by Mah Mahavishnu, it, except that it's uh, scored for orchestra. Fusion never dies, Stu. <laughs> well, you're helping keep keeping that torch burning. Well, we're trying. I know Tom couldn't make, my co-host couldn't make this interview, and he would have loved talking to you, but maybe we'll do it uh, another time, or we'll do part two. I really appreciate uh, you coming on the Jazz Rocks podcast, Stu. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Walter. I'm Tom Alexander, co-host of Jazz Rocks. The only thing I love more than discussing music is playing it. For my latest recording, I've put away most of my electronics and taken a right turn down a familiar road. Overbrook Avenue is an acoustic piano tribute to the street and neighborhood where I grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania. Returning to my solo piano roots with the help of my good friend guitarist John Fifield was a wonderful musical experience. Made up primarily of original compositions as well as a few familiar themes, Overbrook Avenue is a musical portrait of a very special time and place. I hope you'll listen. Overbrook Avenue is the new recording by pianist Tom Alexander, available now in digital download on iTunes and other major distributors. Visit TomAlexanderMusic.com. Hi, this is Leonardo Pavkovic from Munjun Records to Europe, and you are listening to the Jazz Rocks podcast with Tom Alexander and Walter Kalowski. And welcome back to the Jazz Rocks podcast along with Walter Kalowski. I'm Tom Alexander. Hey, Walter, uh, that was a lot of fun. Great interview with Stu Goldberg. Excellent stuff. I'm sorry you missed it because I know you would have really wanted to be a part of that. I. I yeah, al I always yeah, yeah. enjoy I always enjoy talking to Stu over the years. I'm so happy for his success. Oh, definitely, and he was certainly a big influence. One of those one of those guys, you know, that uh, I always listened to. Being a keyboard player myself, and and was inspired by his playing, and uh, of course all those guys from that era. You know, so Stu's definitely you know high on the list of uh, all those exciting uh, keyboard players from that era. Hey, speaking of exciting, we're getting ready to debut a new segment here on this edition of the Jazz Rocks podcast, and here we go. <laughs> This is the JRP Featured Artist, perspectives and music from contemporary and leading new artists in fusion, jazz, and progressive music. Hi, this is Rob Garland, and I am honored to be a JRP Featured Artist. I was born in England in a small seaside town called Margate, and I started playing the guitar at age 14. Early influences were rock guitarists like Gary Moore, Eddie Van Halen, and Brian May. Then a little later came Jeff Beck, Richie Blackmore, and Jimi Hendrix. And from there, I started investigating the blues and jazz. A defining moment was hearing Steve Lukather's playing with Toto, as it changed my perception of the way jazz harmony could be fused with rock energy. In my teenage years, I played in different genres of bands around the southeast of England and at colleges throughout London. I went to university in Canterbury and at that time discovered landmark fusion albums by Tony Williams' Lifetime, Mahavishnu Orchestra and Herbie Hancock. 
But my favorite fusion band was Weather Report, which I guess is interesting in that they didn't have a guitar player, but I just love the groove of that band. So I started obsessively listening to drummers and horn players, Vinnie Colaiuta, Simon Phillips, Michael Brecker, Miles Davis, Bill Evans. I was also a massive Prince fan and I loved Frank Zappa. Before I left university, I made the decision that whatever it took, I was going to be a professional musician because music was my life and I just loved it. I still feel as passionate about it today as I did then, probably even more so. In my mid-twenties, I moved to the US, split my time between teaching guitar, performing with my jazz blues trio, and we played hundreds of gigs through the Midwest and the South. I had an instructional book published in 2007, which led to me working for Truefire. I have an online classroom called Guitar Babylon and Truefire instructional courses. I'm always writing new music. I released a collection of songs in 2014, the Seven Voices EP earlier this year, and then about a month ago, a new digital single. I've been very fortunate to meet and perform with some amazing musicians. Currently, I play gigs around LA with my fusion group, Rob Garland's Eclectic Trio, venues such as Alva's Showroom and The Mint, and I teach online through truefire.com and via Skype. I also do sessions from my studio. Here's the first track from the Seven Voices EP, a song called M.M. Swing. This features the guys from my trio, Carl Thompson on drums and Austin Underhill on bass. M.M. stands for my favorite scale, melodic minor, which the melody is derived from.
Now we have the title track of the Seven Voices EP, again featuring the guys from my trio. The time signature moves between 7-8 and 4-4, so this will be a good one to ask your non-musician friends to dance to.
can visit me online at www.robgarland.net. That's R-O-B-G-A-R-L-A-N-D because of this funny accent. You can sign up for my free newsletter. You'll see live dates, guitar lessons, and music. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that silliness. And I want to say a massive thank you to Tom Alexander and Walter Koloski for inviting me to be a Jazz Rocks podcast featured artist and for all the work you do, keeping this music alive, keeping it in people's consciousness. Hope to see you all very soon. And thank you. To be considered as a JRP featured artist, please contact us at Info at alexanderproductions.com. Brand new segment on the Jazz Rocks podcast. That's the JRP featured artist and Rob Garland, our debut on this edition of the show. And uh, great stuff, Walter. Yeah, and a great artist to start this all off with. That was fantastic. Yep. It's amazing. Time just has run out on us here to another show in the can. Uh, Lots of fun today on the show. Next month, we'll be back with another exciting edition of the Jazz Rocks podcast. From Miami, I'm Tom Alexander. And from Boston, I'm Walter Koloski. We'll see you next time, everybody. So long. The Jazz Rocks podcast with Tom Alexander and Walter Koloski is produced at Studio Alpha in Miami in association with Alexander Productions. If you'd like to advertise on the Jazz Rocks podcast, send a note to info at alexanderproductions.com. Visit us on Twitter at Jazz Rocks PC. Our SoundCloud page is Jazz Rocks Podcast.